Welcome to Happy Homes and Gardens. I'm your host. My name is Daphne Royce. I am a real estate broker, architecture, and interior designer. Agriculture has always been a big part of the California economy. We have recently faced challenges due to unpredictable weather patterns such as drought and flooding. The cost of food to consumers has increased since during the inflation. Exactly has a solution for farmers who produce leafy green vegetables. Let's welcome Russell Co, who is the founder of Exactly. Welcome, Russell. Hi, Daphne. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Please tell us who you are and how did you start Exactly? Well, my name is Russell Cole. I started Exactly after a few years of being in the agriculture industry, working in the rare amendment space. I found through a series of phone calls and uh, people introducing cricket droppings, so cricket feces to me. It's called frass. Um, it's a rare and unique amendment that's very, very helpful to grow plants. Um, I was approached to essentially productize it, organic certify it, and bring it to market. Uh, I did that and learned a lot about farming, indoor agriculture, outdoor agriculture, uh, control environment, greenhouse, etc. And that was really my 101. Um, that was several years ago, around five years ago. And throughout that process, I learned a lot of uh, the the general narrative about farming in, in terms of it being a bit reactive and that it could be more proactive. As I worked with farmers on trials and looking at their operations, it wasn't my job to help them become more efficient. My job was to make sure that the frass product was working as best as possible. But I did take note of several inefficiencies that I felt technology could benefit. And from there, once I decided that the amendment space in the agriculture industry wasn't for me personally. Uh, I decided to lean on a lot of that learning and experience and ambition and interest for innovation, uh, which ended up helping me develop this company that we are now running. It's called Exactly Crop Insights, and it's a California-based ag tech startup. I know you don't farm, but you're helping farmers. What tool do you use to helping farmers? That's a great question. Several tools is, is the very general answer. Um, Exactly's mission is to help farmers get more out of their land with less through leveraging data analytics. And that, again, sounds very lofty. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we do is we actually collect imagery from drones uh, and other sensors that we're looking at potentially tractor mounted sensors. And eventually once very low earth orbit satellites um, are part of the equation, we can leverage those. But image collection is really what we what we need to, to acquire. Um, and we then process those images and we then analyze those images. And those are the tools we use would be the hardware and the software around the data collection, data processing, and then the display of that information we provide the farmers. What kind of tool do you use to find over hundreds and thousands of acres of farms to collect data? It's an ongoing exercise um, in cost reduction for us, to be honest. We, we've flown really expensive equipment uh, with high, high-tech cameras, uh, multi-spectral cameras, hyper-spectral cameras, regular RGB cameras attached to ex expensive drones, as well as less expensive drones and less expensive sensors and cameras. And truthfully, we, we found a happy medium between the very expensive and less expensive. Um, we sometimes use what's called a DJI Matrice 2 or 300. Um, that's a drone. That's a professional indus industrial drone. Um, we equip that drone with a variety of sensors, as mentioned, and it does a lot of the work that we need. We can fly the drone anywhere from 20 feet to 400 feet in the air, as long as it's underneath the, the ceiling that the regulations have put out. And we're finding that that we're able to capture the imagery of the fields we need to to process it effectively um, at a very high height, which is exciting for us because it helps us capture images faster uh, for a reduced cost. So, what is the difference between flying over twenty feet and four hundred feet? I I would say um, if you think about flying above, if you think about looking top down at a piece of land. Um, if you're 
you know, 20 feet above that, that piece of land, you can probably see every single plant there, right? With your own eyes. Um, if you're flying, if you're raising yourself 400 feet with your own eyes, you probably won't be able to see every plant, which is where those extra powerful sensors come in handy, where if you fly higher with a, a more powerful sensor, you can still see each individual plant. So it really does become a, a delicate balance of what type of sensor quality you have with the height you fly. Uh, and then also taking into consideration the wind speed um, when you're working with drones. And again, that's why we're, we're starting to look at other possibilities with tractor mounted sensors as well. How do you analyze the data you collect? Why is this information important to farmers? The data we collect is analyzed through a series of, of processes. And the first is that we collect the images. They're all individual images. And we then take those images and stitch them together to build almost like a bigger puzzle from those images. And then that bigger stitched image, it's called an orthomosaic. And we then process that through a software that counts every single plant in that image. It also looks at the health of every single individual plant of that image, the water stress or drought of all of the crops in that image. And this is something that we do to share with the farmers. We want that information. We want the crop counts. We want the health of the fields so that we can help the farming side of a, an enterprise farmer triage issues that may come up on fields that are performing to a lesser standard than they would expect. And that's how it really helps farmers in the, in the early stages of our offering, where we're helping farmers understand which fields need attention. And in a world where labor is becoming more scarce and expensive, farmers really need to apply all of their efforts where it's required the most. And our technology helps with that. Exactly flies drones. And we also combine the drone imagery that we collect with satellite imagery. Uh, it's a sophisticated process that, that allows us to develop and provide predictions. Um, the reason we fly drones is to get a snapshot of a field and understand what's happening on any given day that we go to that field and fly that field. The satellite imagery, which is a lot more coarse information, we can receive very cheaply on a daily or bi-daily basis to then complete the picture from, let's say, the static snapshot of the drone image that we collect that's very granular. Uh, we can then extract, we can then form the rest of our opinion and picture of that field over time because of the satellite data. And that's how we build our harvest prediction models. Uh, that's what we've been using to help farmers understand the water moisture content of their fields, the health of their fields. Um, because it is really expensive to fly drones every day. So we commit to flying a farmer's field once with a drone, every single acre they hire us for. And then we use other technologies like satellite technologies to assist us in, in developing and forming the rest of the picture for the farmer um, for the rest of that cycle. How long is this cycle? Cycles vary uh, from crop to crop. So if you're looking at spinach, it could be 15 to 30 days. If you're looking at broccoli, it could be anywhere between 60 and 100 days. It really depends also if you're planting with direct seeds or if you're buying transplants from a nursery. So already uh, seedlings that have been basically growing for weeks um, that you just put in directly into the ground. Um, so let's take, for example, a broccoli transplant. That field might might take 70 days to harvest. But if you just plant a seed, uh, it might take 100. I think one more point to add is that depending on the weather and the sunlight and the temperature, um, you'll also find that some warmer climates might produce uh, crop cycles faster than, than other climates, right? So if it's more hospitable for crops to grow and thrive, those crops will grow faster, they'll need to be harvested faster. Um, so that that's what we we found as well. So some crops in Salinas Valley might take three months, but in Yuma, Arizona, it might take 60 days. Great to know. Yeah, farming is one of those industries that I never imagined would hold so much value and information for me as an individual, um, because it's it's such a an enormous space that people and myself included used to look at that space as a, oh, this is just farming, right? Farming is farming. You know, what, what could the differences be? But the truth is between every crop, uh, every geography, 
every environment, every farmer and practice of farming, you know, you have immense variables, um, let alone outside factors like the weather and then pests and then other things, right? Um, it is one of the most interesting things I've ever been able to learn. Uh, one of the proudest, it is the proudest company that I've ever built. Um, I'm so proud to be the founder of this company. I couldn't be more thankful to be a part of improving our food supply chain at a time when our planet's population is increasing every day and we need to find ways to feed those people uh, healthy and nutritious and affordable food. Um, it's something that I'm, I'm so passionate and excited to be a part of. And I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see an image of, of what I'm talking about. And this is a field. From a bird's eye view, you could see all the plants in the field. And this is taken at 110 feet uh, with 453 images collected to create that ortho mosaic. And you can zoom in on that image and look at each individual plant. And this data, if you take a look out, actually, this is a better image. You can see every single plant and it's colorized green, yellow, and red. And the green plants are, are of good quality and size. The yellow is in the middle and then the red is the worst. And zooming in a bit more, you can see the diameter tolerances are set so that every plant that's over 4.3 inches in diameter will come up as green. And 4.3 and under is yellow or red. And this is something that helps farmers understand very quickly where the problems are in their fields. But even more so, uh, what's, what's really important for farmers is, is not to force them to look at these images. It's to take this information and give it to them in a way that's easy to understand and digest. So instead of looking through the images and making notes, we have a platform and a dashboard that actually helps the farmer. And I'm showing it to you now on the screen for those listeners who can't see this. Um, and this dashboard is really simple. It just tells you the ranch name, how many plants are in that field, uh, what the losses are of that field. And I'm going to flip to the next image. I'm going to zoom in on the, the losses in the field. So you can actually see a list. If you have hundreds of fields that are planted and that you have to manage as a farmer, you can see every single field at a glance and actually rank them and sort them dynamically. So you can see which ones have the, the worst losses to target, for example. And this one I'm, I'm highlighting, it's 40% loss to target. You know, some fields are three and a half percent loss to target, but some of them are 40%. You want to go to those fields first, again, because labor is scarce. You need to put your attention and energy where it's needed the most. So beyond this, what I think is interesting after we help the farmers and the farm managers triage fields that need attention is that we also have a predictive model that we've built. It's a proprietary prediction model that helps cultivators and harvesters and operations and sales teams understand exactly what's going to come out of that field. And this is far in advance. So currently what's happening is the information that we have um, that, that farmers get about harvest is usually post-harvest. And they're, they're estimating prior to at roughly a 30 to 40% inaccuracy level. But after harvest, they then realize what they actually have. Our technology predicts crops and harvest outputs at a 90% or better level. And this helps operations and sales teams plan accordingly to make sure that if you have an offtake agreement, let's say it's Safeway or Walmart, and you're short, you really do need to either find another uh, field to harvest to make up that shortfall, or you need to coordinate with Walmart or Safeway and say, hey, can we deliver a week late or a few days late and juggle your inventory? Um, if you don't do that, you're essentially gonna piss off a customer and you're not going to be able to maintain excellent business continuity. In the next slide, I just wanna show you another image. Um, this is a slide that highlights the actual genetics in a field that we can keep track of as well. Every bit of metadata that we have in a field ends up in our system. And with that, we're able to, to, if you see the pie chart, imagine a pie chart with seven or eight different genetics and it's broken down in percentages, which genetics are working the best or the worst. We've often come across farmers who you know, plant several genetics in a season and sometimes one field was just a, a little pesty. It gave them a little bit of trouble. And so they might wanna discontinue using that genetic. Meanwhile, the information might show them that that's not the, the worst performing genetic and that they might wanna consider a different genetic to eliminate from their active genetics. Right. And this is something that we find obviously helps farmers. It's a deeper data analysis that we can provide after we've worked with our clients for a longer period of time. 
Uh, and then we're also able to, to look at views like understanding which fields perform best, which ones traditionally perform worse. Farmers typically know this already, uh, but this is also further information that we collect and store. So I just wanted to share a bit about that. Um, our platform is being used daily by farmers today. Um, we're really, really excited to continue improving the platform with the feedback we're getting and helping. At the end of the day, we want to make sure farmers make more money, make more profits, more food gets into the supply chain, and that waste is reduced. That's the goal. Excellent. This really help farmers predict their harvest. Is your product user-friendly? Do you provide training to the farmers? Yeah, we do find our product is very user-friendly. It's a simple sign-in dashboard. The information I shared with you is very easy to access. And ultimately, we can provide that information in reports or the farmer or user themselves can log in and, and navigate that dashboard as they feel. Um, for us, it's something that we'd like to continue improving. As, as we've noted, the biggest challenge in our industry is to help farmers get the benefits from the technology, right? Where drones and satellite images and, and pictures are, you know, I think a thing of the past. And we're taking all of that information instead of forcing a, a farmer to actually review all that information. We're just giving them the, the straight detailed outputs, the numbers, and helping them understand where they can find value. I think the next step um, would be to ensure that farmers can have access to that information without having to log into a computer. I think just using their voice, speaking to a technology layer that allows somebody just to ask uh, like a Siri or a chat GPT, you know, just something that allows a farmer to say, hey, what are my best fields? And hey, what are, what are my worst performing genetics? Or, you know, do I have enough inventory to cover this sales order for this week? You know, like these, these questions on the fly that farmers really do need to worry about every day. Um, I think there's, there's more value we can continue to bring. Currently, without your tool, how do farmers access their data? Ah, that's a fantastic question. And, and that's the biggest challenge that we're solving. So traditionally, um, farmers would have gone out into the field. There are a few methods that, that have occurred in the past, and they still occur, um, where you measure a field in, in, and you sample the field. So you walk 60 feet of an acre, let's say, and an acre is huge. It has hundreds, if not thousands of feet, linear feet. But imagine walking just 60 of those feet and then taking account of the crops and extrapolating the whole entire acre based on that one sample you took. Right. So that's one method that, that we know of. Um, it's highly inaccurate. I think it's something that that gives you a number. But again, it's something that doesn't lead to the best outcome or, or as great an accuracy as something we can provide. Um, another method that we've understood is being deployed is just taking last year's uh, crop output totals and either using that total as an average for every field um, or taking that number and reducing that. Uh, number by 10 or 15 or 20 percent. I think that the farm managers have their own way of looking at things. Um, they've been doing it for a very long time. Uh, they know what they're doing. And, and quite frankly, it's, it's an art as much as it's a science. I think we're looking at it a bit more scientifically. Um, farmers can look at it a bit more artfully, um, but they really get into the crops. They, they dig under the crops. They look at the moisture of the crops. They, you know, take a few and analyze them. Um, they understand the weather patterns. They know historically what's happened in a field. But a lot of that is tribal knowledge. And I think it's really important to, to mention that, you know, between individuals in the industry, some people want to share that information and other people might not. When you have all of the data in a central repository, that information is there for the organization permanently. I think that's a big difference between, you know, what, what has happened in the past and what's happening today. Where are your tools currently in use? We're working with farmers, predominantly lettuce growers in the Salinas Valley. And we have a couple of clients that we work with, a couple of the top pr producing lettuce growers in North America. And they are leveraging our tools to ensure that their harvests are, are predicted, to make sure that their sales teams are informed, their operations can manage their, their human labor and capital to deploy them properly. Um, and we're finding deeper insights as well for them that we're very excited about. You know, we've, we've saved some of our clients um, year over year. We've been a part of reducing losses in the field by 13% in some cases, uh, depending on the crop. And we're very excited by that. 
For example, we have a different weather pattern this year. We were very wet in the early part of the year. Will your tour detect how the year will go、um, for the farmers? Yeah, it's interesting. I think、um, a, a big、um, distinction to make between different types of crops is that、uh, you know the leafy green segment is a much shorter crop cycle.、Um, it's it's also more spread out. So, and I say that to compare to something like a corn, wheat, or soy, that is. Is、um, a much larger area of land that's covered. That's covered, and it's a longer cycle. So, if you have inclement weather、uh, for those larger row crops, your your season, the output's going to be impacted much more significantly、uh, than a flash flood, for example. Now, that's not to diminish what's happened in the Salinas Valley. I just want to make sure、um, that we differentiate between crops and weather patterns and the impact that weather has. Of course, it always has an impact. Uh, the flash flooding was something that that we, not we, I mean the farm, the entire farming community, and we as consumers、uh, who have to pay the price at the store,、um, we're all feeling. And I think that that the water moisture is a big problem.、Um, we flew a bunch of fields for farmers just to make sure that they had a, a visual aid of of the flooding because it was it was completely flooded in some cases.、Um, it delayed farmers from being able to plant.、Um, so so per, the, the biggest issue was just. Timelines, I think, were delayed、um, because crops were not able to be life was not able to be supported with that much water, and and because of that, the result is that there are less crops in the supply chain right now、uh, because these crops take seventy to one hundred days,、um, and the flooding was within that period of time, and we're playing catch up. So farmers decided to keep a lot of their crop production、uh, down south in Arizona, Yuma, for example. Um, and delay coming back into the Salinas Valley, and those who did come into the Salinas Valley experienced a lot of challenges.、Uh, had to monitor the weather every day, monitor the water moisture every day,、uh, and we definitely have played a part in that. We have satellite imagery, we have our drone imagery that helps farmers see the water moisture of their fields. Can farmer plant different things? Crop rotation. As- crop rotation. Yes, yes, it's encouraged. It's something that farmers do. It's something that. Uh, again, that's almost like、uh, the art, the artistry portion of the industry, where farmers know if you continue to plant the same crop that requires the same nutrients、um, consistently on the same piece of land, you're going to end up running into、uh, nutrient deficiencies and、um, basically compromised immunity within those future crops that you plant. So a greater risk of disease, a greater risk of pest infestation, if you continue to plant the same crop on the same piece of land. So farmers do have an understanding. If you plant broccoli, let's say for two cycles,、um, you might want to alternate that with carrots or celery or lettuce.、Um, our data actually shows which rotations to conduct between cycles, and and helps farmers understand which which trends are working within. Specific fields.、Um, you also have to look at the fact that it's it's a、uh, microclimates exist, right? So, just because two cycles of broccoli is okay in one in one area, it doesn't mean two cycles of broccoli might work out in another area. It, it depends on what's currently there in the ground,、uh, the nutrients that we can gain. It, it depends on、uh, what your principles of farming are. If you're farming organically or if you're farming conventionally,、um, it, it relies on a lot of different types of Of、um, data points and variables to to make those decisions, and that's something that we're tracking right now. So we're excited to help our farmers do that. Wonderful! Can your tool use to prevent plant diseases or crop eating insects? Absolutely, and I'll give you a quick example.、Um, we, when you rank the fields in that list that you saw, and you see every field, and you you pick on a field that might be you know thirty or forty percent lost to target. That's a significant loss. A farm manager would go to that field and, and quickly discover that there's a problem, and those problems can range from it wasn't planted properly to a, there's a disease or a pest infestation. And in one case, we saw、uh, cabbage maggots in a broccoli field, and and the bro- half of the field was actually just destroyed from these cabbage maggots, and half of the field was salvageable. So the farm manager got there and decided to essentially destroy one half of the field and salvage the other. And if they didn't go Early that early, they would have lost more、uh, acreage.、Um, so we look at that as a win because it allowed a farmer to ensure that out of a five-acre field, they were still able to harvest two and a half acres. You know, instead of leaving it for another week or two and it possibly、um, not being able to be harvested. Can farmers rely solely on machines 
or robust to farm? It's a great question. I would say the, the short answer is no. Farmers cannot solely rely on robots to farm. Uh, do I think robotics and automation can help farming? Absolutely. Do I think we need robotics and automation in some parts of the world? Absolutely. But I think this, this question you know, begs more questioning. Um, it really depends on the geo uh, environment, right? The, the, the type of economics that exists within that space. So if you have a country that has very, very low cost and readily accessible labor, you may not need automated equipment that, uh, you know, does all your harvesting or planting because you have labor available at a, at a good cost. Um, but if you're in California, for example, where labor is scarce and it's it's gaining in, in cost, um, harvest robotics or, or planting robotics is, is an incredible addition to a farming enterprise. Um, there's a new a, an event that happens every year for farming robotics called FIRA USA. And they're a really big event that brings together all of the automation equipment within farming. And I think it's a space that's young, um, but it's growing and growing quickly. And I think it's it's definitely helping farmers. There's a lot to improve, but I think again, we're, we're seeing the benefits from farming and automation. Can you collect data for crops other than leafy green vegetables? Do you think it may be possible to develop new tools to be used in grain fields or watchers? Yeah, we as a company exactly does help other crop producers than just the salad bowl crops. We look at any opportunity as a challenge. Uh, we work with rice growers, organic rice growers. Uh, we're looking at alfalfa seed fields. We've worked with the California Strawberry Commission. Um, we're always constantly looking for different crops that we can apply our technologies to. Uh, leafy greens have just taken up the most of our time because I think right now there's the most value we can provide there. Uh, when it comes to different industry segments that you mentioned, like the, the broad acreage crops like corn or the orchards or citrus crops or nut, tree nut crops, um, I think, again, it, it, it comes down to understanding that, that farming is very different uh, depending on the crop, the geography, the environment. And, and being able to apply technologies within each of those spaces um, becomes its own challenge, its own very unique customized challenge. Uh, whereas row crops, which, which don't generate as much revenue, um, row crops don't have as much capital to spend on, on farming robotics, for example, or you know technologies that uh, a crop like spinach or lettuce might uh, be able to afford because their revenue breaker is is significantly higher. Um, this is this is the biggest I think contributor for farming enterprises to be able to adopt technology. It's it's the value of the crop, um, but then also some challenges that are presented um, when when you go big into row crop and broad acreage crops is that there's just so much space to cover, right? So the actual cost to deploy some technology solutions is incredibly high. Right, because drones can only fly maybe 20, 30 minutes right now um, to cover 500 acres or 100 acres or 1,000 acres. You'd need to fly that drone. You'd need to land it, collect the data several times, change the batteries. It becomes a logistics nightmare. Um, but then that, that's where you see, again, row crops, they, they are leveraging satellite technologies and weather technologies, weather system pattern technologies to help them make decisions. Um, orchards, I'd say... Uh, definitely can benefit from technology. Um, there are several companies that provide services to orchards. And I think that it's it's a space that has a ceiling because there's only so much you could do for a, a tree. Uh, a tree is a permanent crop. If you think about it that way, you don't plant it and harvest the entire tree. You plant, you know, the tree grows and then you get the the harvest from it every season, right? The, the apples or if it's a vine, the grapes. Um, but those those plants are are semi permanent to permanent plants, and uh, then when you look at our segment again, the leafy greens, which is why I think it's it's the most challenging, is because the cycles change every thirty to hundred days. You know, it's a brand new plant. Every seed you plant, you harvest. Um, it's it's a very different space. We're very excited about it. Do you have a plan to use technology other than drones and satellite images? Yes, yes, we have actually improved our drone data collection process quite a bit over the last year, uh, where it used to take us maybe 20 minutes to fly a field. We can get this, the, the 
adequate data required to process and analyze in two minutes or three minutes. Um, so this has actually presented us with, with an opportunity to continue using drones. Uh, that said, we're, we're still looking at other options. We have trials happening now with tractor mounted sensors, and we're looking at various ways to collect data um, to ensure that farmers can get as low cost a, pro a price for our services possible. I mean, at the end of the day, the less we have to pay to operate our business, the less we'll charge the farmer. And we're interested in driving our prices down as far and fast as possible to gain widespread adoption as fast as possible. Are you currently only servicing farmers in California? No, we do service farmers around North America. So we have a couple of farmers in Canada that we've worked with, and we have one farmer in Michigan who we work with. We have a, and then a number of farms in California. The farmers in California also have operations in Arizona, uh, Yuma, like I mentioned, and then they also have farms in Mexico. We haven't entered the Mexican market, but we're looking to. Um, a lot of the, the big players in North America have operations in, in Mexico. Can you ask how farmers can contact you for your services? Well, my name is Russell Cole and my LinkedIn profile, if you search Russell Cole and exactly you'll find me. Uh, my email is actually here on the left. If you can see my screen, it's rcole at exactly.com. And you can email me anytime. It's also info at exactly.com to reach our team. And we'll have somebody, you know, get back in touch immediately. And then we also have a website, www.exactly.com that allows people to submit requests and we respond within 24 or 48 hours. And we're really looking forward to serving more farmers and making sure that this ecosystem of food supply chain is improved and more people gain access to nutritious foods at an affordable price. Thank you so much, Maso. I will link your website with this uh, interview. And thank you very much for your time. This is very informative information about your new technology. And I'm sure it will help the agriculture farmers and also help the consumer. We hopefully reduce the causes for our food sources. Agreed. Thank you so much for having me, Daphne. It was a real pleasure and I look forward to chatting with you in the future. Thank you.